There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, welcome to another Word in Your Attic, where we're excitingly, we're joined by the book publishing legend, the co-founder of the QI Quiz, 50% of the backlisted podcast, and the celebrated kind of part-time farmer, really, the great John Mitchinson. <laughs> hey! John, lovely to see you. Uh, so you're still to... farming. You, you, uh, uh, well, you had the big farm, and you've got the small one now. In, in, in the sort of post-Clarkson way of things, I guess I can say that I am. I mean, I would never describe myself as a farmer, and my farming friends would laugh heartily if the name was ever attached to me i am a i'm a hobby farmer i'm a small holder at best i have uh i have uh, pigs i have kept sheep but i've got pigs and uh which i share with a friend my pig partner dave and i've got uh, uh, i've got bees which are you know um they're not they don't they barely need farming and uh intermittently chickens um so, so that's good they're kind of ornamental this is not it's not well, a commercial I, I, thing I at eat, all I, I i make what i the reason I have pigs is I love making the best possible use of the meat that pigs produce. And I know that will be an upsetting thought for many, many of your, um, not, not, many not, of your not viewers. for us. But, you know, <laughs> I've got one word, which is bacon. I've got another word, which is sausage. Um, yeah, get out of that. And the, you <laughs> know, the, also, it's kind of, I was having this, it's not exactly an argument, is it? But, We've in this. There are form animals are a form of technology. We've developed these breeds to to eat. It's just bot, bot, bottom line. They, you know, there are one hundred and sixty five thousand pigs slaughtered. Um, I think it's it's like every month or something in the UK. It's a lot of it's a lot of pigs. Maybe maybe I've overestimated, but um, they you know you couldn't just turn them loose. <laughs> they, they, you know they wouldn't survive they depend on us for that, their survival. that would be catastrophic <laughs> yes it would i mean amusing short-term amusing like the goats of the plan did know you know but um uh and and i do know it's interesting things like on the with these rewilding projects that domesticated pigs once you let them go within a couple of generations they're sort of they're, they're going right back into sort of looking and, and behaving more like wild boar but i you know i look after them they're, they're immaculately looked after. They have a very, very happy, if short, life. <laughs> and do you, then, do you do? And then I, of... I turn, I turn, I butcher that we make the most delicious food out of as much of the pig as we can, the minimal waste. That's the idea. So, do you do you like PG Woodhouse as Lord Ensworth? Uh, yes. You know, spend a lot of time uh, swinging on a fire bar gate, contemplating pigs and yeah. and the universe. And well, they they are the, they're, the, they're, the... they're immensely stress busting as animals. I mean, yeah. they can if they're if they're hungry, they can be loud and. But watching them wallowing around, I had an amazing boar that was for eight, uh, he, he was, I had him for eight years. And uh, he was called Buster because of his unfeasibly large uh, <laughs> accoutrements. I mean, they were ridiculous. People would come from all over the county to see them. And he, and this is a had, Viz reference, I tell Yes, you. it's a Viz <laughs> reference. Uh, Buster Gonads is, is the, uh, it was the strip, genius yeah. strip. Um, but he, you know, he was just, the, he had the happiest life, you know, wallowing, eating, um, off, you know, he, he, in the end he was, he got slightly as they do, he's got a big pig, he got slightly arthritic and we, we had to take the decision to, right. to, to send him on to, 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 to the next place. But I, I mean, I know this sounds ludicrous, but I'm, we're lucky we have a, a small family owned abattoir. <laughs> <laughs> so and the, the slaughterman. Uh, a legend called Dutchy, Dutchy Holland, who is um, a bit like one of the extras from from uh, from Clarkson's program. Is just and he's brilliant. You know, he 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 makes sure the animals are, are well looked after. So I think as far as you can do it sustainably, you know, that's why. I knew, and I eat less. Paradoxically, eat less meat because I don't like really having to buy meat. I mean, we we still buy some. We buy chicken. But um, generally, don't buy anything else. We've got, we're sort of self-sufficient in pig and swap up for beef and that kind of thing. And, it, and so, we did for a long time have our own lamb as well, which is amazing. So Clarkson's farm is near you. Is he one of your near neighbours? No, he's literally local. That's and, another and Beckham. Caleb went to the same school. We went to Chippy, the same school my boys went to. So 
uh, there's it's 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 very it's very local. It's very I much. I remember seeing you at a Cornbury Festival years ago when Word Magazine was uh, was one of its yeah. sponsors, and uh, I remember the bizarre side of seeing uh, Jeremy Clarkson and David Cameron heading off to the mosh pit for Echo and the Bunny Men. <laughs> I thought this yeah. is it's peculiar. Yeah, the poshest <laughs> mosh pit ever. I mean, it was, it was known as it was no Corn, Cornbury. No, sadly, not not taking place this year. Is sort of relocated from Cornbury, which is down the road, to Great Chew, but kept the name, um, and. It was, it was known as yeah, Poshstock. Posh that's, that's right. right. I remember that. It was. It was, and we still joke. You know, if you ever wanted to see Brian Adams or Squeeze, you just had to turn up. They, they were almost always on the bill. You know, <laughs> that's true. Uh, well, it, look, it, we ought to go back to our traditional question uh, on word in your attic, which is: Do you remember the record playing equipment in the household where you grew up, and yes, what was it? And was, what records were playing? In fact. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was mostly classical, but we we had one pop record, which amazingly I still have. My dad's only um, kind of uh, my my dad's only toe in the water of popular recorded music was he was a he was a Buddy Holly fan, and we had this. The equipment we had was one of those grey. It was a grey Bush turntable with built-in speakers, you know, sort of vinyl-y kind of top with a clip that you took off. I mean. And, and it stood on a stand and there were records underneath and the records were all classical of, you know, kind of the usual Beethoven, Mozart, a little bit of Bach, which I kind of liked as a kid and some weird smaller records of Maria Callas singing, which I was particularly taken with. And then this, this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, wow. <lovely. laughs> which my dad bought. Cheap I think, label. In yeah. the mid seventies, yeah, and yeah. it's it's you can see it says Denison Smith Rotorua on there oh, because we oh, by this stage we we we'd emigrated to New Zealand in, at the end of nineteen seventy five. Oh which is, goodness, which is the kind of um, but I played this record to death. I mean, I, I can probably still, I can probably still. It's like you know sensory deprivation if you've only got one. <laughs> pop music record if you're only going to have one record john there's yeah. a very strong argument for saying if you're only going to have one if a martian arrives and, and only has 30 seconds to take away a pop record buddy holly's greatest hits will do you absolutely fine because you know, you know that's what? where the beatles come from I, completely that's right. where bob dylan Jeez. comes from and, and beatles and, early set lists straight off that album uh yeah I, I mean, and I think also he could sing great lyrics. He, he could do everything. Yeah, uh, do everything. great guitar, great guitar licks. Um, yeah. You know, the crickets. What's not to like? No, um, which is I, that's where the Beatles got their name, obviously. But yeah, yeah. so, so, so you yeah, moved, that was you my, moved to my New Zealand in '75. Is that yeah. where, where were you before, before that? that you, you're going to ask me that. What was the first single that you remind you remember right, playing go. with your own? Yeah, mother, go, on. go on. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is this is this is really embarrassing. Really embarrassing. No. Because it was, I'd like to teach the world to sing by the music. <laughs> There's nothing no, wrong no with that. No shame at all. But listen, there is a, there is a, now I haven't got, I don't own it anymore, but I still, in my mind's eye, I know, ex I can see it because you, you, you could in those days. Remember, you know, didn't have many records, had one single and it was a Polydor. So I think it must have been seven, it was 72, I think. 71? I, 71? Yeah, I think I bought it in 72. Oh, okay, fine. Because I, yeah, I remember it was definitely Polydor. And the thing was that the B-side I liked a lot better, which is a, a track by um, Australian rocker Pete Doyle, who was one of the new seekers, called Boomtown. Oh. And it had, it had sort of, it had a bit, of, a bit of a hand clap. It had a, quite a sort of raunchy guitar riff. It kind of, it was the first time I really remember, I, I, I'll come back to this, thinking there's something about, this is this what I like, I like this. And then 73 happened, and I don't, I, again, don't have any of the singles, but this was, I don't know if you can see that. But oh, it's Dave Hill. It's Dave yeah. Hill. It's Dave Hill. Dave Hill with admiring girls behind yeah, him. Yeah, one of them is his wife. One of them is the, the girlfriend of, um, of uh, uh, or the wife of Don Powell, who died in the car crash. And then one of them is the person who's actually made that ridiculous outfit. So in, I became, in his defense, briefly, Don Powell, I don't think, died. No, he didn't. No, he, he, was badly he was saying, you know, he said to his, oh, his, his girlfriend, girlfriend, his girlfriend, his girlfriend, sorry, his girlfriend, I'm wife, sorry, yeah, okay, died in the, in the crash. Cool. But yeah. if it was, a, it was, but that was the year I think they had, they had an unfeasible number of, and that was it really. I, I, I the next single I bought was Metal Guru by T Rex, which is quite, that's quite an arc, don't you think? From <laughs> I'd like to teach the world to sing. Well, yeah. But I think. So you I had a Slade doing too. Though. That's my. I've, uh, somebody once said your taste is so broad as to not constitute taste at all, <laughs> and I <laughs> kind of feel 
I feel quite proud of that. I, yes. I, I yeah. can enjoy almost anything. I mean, almost anything. You know, yeah, probably not. Probably not the floral nuts. You know, or, or or the Smurfs or any of those other things that were happening in the seventies. But but you had a Slade period too, then. Yeah, I mean that was very much sort of before we left for New Zealand. Uh, school disco 73, 74, when I was on that cusp of going from primary school to, to big school, as we used to call it. Uh, and this was in Banbury in Oxfordshire, which is very near where I, I live now. So I've yeah. still got the kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's and uh, yeah, uh, Slade, were, Slade were everything you wanted when you were 10, everything. I mean, the, the way they, they were great. They were made, I mean, you remember Top of the Pops was everything in, in those days. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was, the, you know, I had the same, every, every, I imagine everybody of my age is the same thing. My parents coming in, shaking their heads. Saying, well, yeah, the, the sight of Dave Hill that's with that's his super yob belt buckle, where it was, and yeah, that guitar, well, his guitar and the like, crescent moon kind of haircut. Well, oh. I mean, leaping forward, I, I mean, I published Dave's autobiography. At, you did, I remember. Band, and I've got, we're doing another a book with him, with a, with a wonderful um, fashion uh, historian journalist nj stevenson called come on where the noise which is about dave because what dave did was you know he got working class men to wear makeup and put glitter on their faces and, yeah and wear platform shoes and i said did you not get booed and no he said no no people loved it like everywhere we went you know and then you'd not notice the audience would start dressing just like you and and I was thinking the whole thing about platform shoes, which I was desperate to have, you know, and you'd be measuring, are they, are they, are they, are they high enough? Yeah. It was, that was all driven by Top of the Pops, I'm guessing, you know. Um, yeah, it would be. It, it would, would be. be. And because the thing about Top of the Pops, the key thing is you watched it with your parents, whether you yeah. wanted to or not. But actually, if you and didn't they, watch it with your parents, it wasn't as much fun because it was the tension. It was the tension. Of, is it a boy or is it a girl? That's but what all, made it all, so. Also, they would have there would be an appreciable number of acts on top of the pops that they would like. Yes, because the chart was the new is well, is stuff. The new seekers, yeah, yeah just anything, so anything that was popular in the country was on top of the pops. Family, di- your family dynamic is right there in front of you, isn't it? Yeah. This is, this yeah. is a, a kind of you're, you're wanting you're wanting to like some of the things your parents like because you're still too young to feel that you can make the break, but you're getting completely seduced away by this, by you know people behaving badly. And um, the other thing about it is, it, it it seemed to me that top of the pops. People forget now because people watch the Top of the Pops 2 yeah, yeah. and they think it was one continual sort of parade of amazing 70s music. <laughs> the same songs were played week in, week out. Uh, they were, the, most of Top of the Pops was quite tedious it because was. you'd already seen them. And again, what Dave says is that that was the reason the outfits is that, you know, if you had an, a number one record, you were having to go into Top of the Pops on a weekly basis and you couldn't let the fans down. So you had to come up with something, something new. Something different. Yeah. His, his, his great line, you know, to Noddy and Jim was to say, you write them, I'll sell them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So how long were you in New Zealand for? So I was in New Zealand, formative years, uh, 76. And I came back in, 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 at the end of 1980. In fact, I was... I was in a Singapore hotel on my own for the first time on a st- st- um, stopover, going coming back to the UK to to have a, a gap year, I suppose, as you call it then. I don't think we had that. I think they call it OE in New Zealand, overseas experience. So was that kind of <laughs> And to John travel? Lennon, uh, John Lennon was shot the night I was in there, and oh, I was really? desperately trying to figure out. I could see, I couldn't work out what had happened because I couldn't find an English station on the... Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a kind of, that was a watershed. But, Do you um, remember seeing any band? What, what, what was the first group you ever saw? That, that, <laughs> that would have been before New Zealand. Yeah, um, I saw again slightly shameful. I saw the Glitter Band in Banbury. Hey, in I winter, saw them too in the winter in the Winter Gardens, and they were two drummers. <laughs> they were great. I think I don't know quite what happened. Had Gary floated off at that point, or I don't know. Anyway, they, they, they were, went they, off and made some records on their own. They did. So, so much are quite good. I've still got yes. their album. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the first that, that was the first and then bizarrely when i went to new zealand the first the first live gig i saw there was ocbisa oh <laughs> so, right amazing um, i don't know i think there was the rotorua didn't get many international acts coming to visit so we all just went to it and we actually it was, yeah. it was pretty it was it was a fun filled evening do you remember ocbisa's um kind of tagline do you remember this no. he used to 
crisscross rhythms that explode with happiness. That used to be the line that you <laughs> That's to good. Use. They did. To be honest. They on everything. That is a pre- very precise description of the evening that we enjoyed. But then, I mean, I, what happened, I moved, we moved to Auckland and then punk happened and then everything exploded and that was... Um, and I've just, I've just texted you. I, 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 we formed a band at school. I've just texted you a couple of grainy photos of... Oh, so you so, have. It's so embarrassing. The Chartered Accountants is what we called ourselves. Wow. We came second. That's a good name. We came second to a mime act in, mime act in, the, school, uh, in the school talent show. <laughs> and we played a few gigs and wrote a few songs. I found... Um, I, 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 well, I didn't find, but I... I, I um, I te- Are you the uh, singer? Yeah, I was the singer. And I wrote the terrible lyrics. Our first song was called Middle Class Twats. Oh, God, this and is that- brilliant because we just had Robin Ince on the other day. <laughs> Robin Ince could remember his entire set list, couldn't he, Dave? He pretty much performed the whole show. We did give us a taste to one of your songs. Well, Middle Class Twats was... Um, was it was basically did uh, was a, a kind of a song lambasting the middle class girls who who refused to have anything to do with us in the there class. You, so you and your problems can sit and rot because you're all just middle class twats. <laughs> <laughs> we had another song called Social Failure, which was, uh, I mean, again, terrible. But the the one I really remember. I love the idea that the, it's, really it's, the fault is with them for not fancying you. I can't, <laughs> That's right. I can't. How can you not? Fancy that? But the girls all loved it. Yeah, I remember. I can still remember silly little ribbons in your hair, and when we, <sighs> yeah, and well, you don't care. Yes, it was you, you, the usual rhyming scheme. But I wrote one which I, I thought was was beginning to sort of move towards. There's a sadness in this, but I can't remember what we called it. But the, the opening lines were, <laughs> um, "Now Johnny's gone and Sid's in heaven." We've got to stop living in 77. <laughs> the, the, basic, the basic routine at weekends was we'd go to parties and I would have a plastic bag with these two records oh, in it. Wow. Yeah. God. And that was basically you'd come, you'd take whatever shit was playing off and you'd put these records in, you'd dance uproariously. Um, and I, I, I mean, that was I mean, so rude. So it arrogant. is so rude. So incredibly unpre- so, rude. But we at thought least we were it's quite some, easy some to of... dance to the Sex Pistols. That's <laughs> a great joy. Just a question of leaping off the floor and trying mean, to I, I, still the get, I still get that incredible. And again, full circle. My my uh, my oldest boy George is just finished. They just wrapped on Danny Boyle's series Pistol, which is based on Steve Jones. Oh, is he in it? Oh, right. and he was he was kind of he was stand in and runner and, right, and right. Uh, working for. But uh, so he's an extra in quite a few scenes. He had to do quite a lot of the costume stuff. So it's all kind of come full circle. But the but we I did the, the the gigs that I remember in Auckland of that time that were uh, amazing were uh, the Ramones came and played more or less the so that'd be 1980. It was more or less the end of the century just coming out, and they did a, a Ramones set list, you know, which lasted half an hour, and everybody half got hour. mental. Thirty six yeah. songs. And yeah. <laughs> Um, and this, the Ramones had humour, which I now, looking back, I see was kind of important. Um, there, there, there was a lot of punk that was very, very humorless, and had a um, brilliant stage act too. Yeah, the I mean, two they just looked, would flank I mean, Johnny, so run I, up, you know, and jump up, and fling their legs in the air. And that was, you know, we just we all had t-shirts, uh, leather jackets, knee ripped jeans, um, and and our band was terrible, but we enjoyed, you know, it was, we were plastic punks, as, as I'm sure. You know, it was too. It was all too late. It was 1980 by that stage, and I mean, yeah, you know, by that, e- e- even the new wave was looking tired. And then we were beginning to listen to Joy Division and uh, The Cure, and stuff was changing. Right, right. But I had another what kind of that year of nine, when I came back in 19. I, I did a year here, and then came back, and in 19 spent 1981. Sorry, 1981 in in in, in England. And I went to see the gig that blew me away there was I went to see Stiff Little Fingers at the Friars in Aylesbury. All right. And they were supported by this band with a really annoying lead singer with a high voice called U2. <laughs> I mean, really annoying. <laughs> um, Did you like them? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they, well, they were catchy. You thought they were catchy. And, the, and, you know, they were annoyingly good musicians. But I loved Stiff Little Fingers. I mean, that that had been a... You know, there was, there was a sort of group of albums, and the other, I suppose, the other one that I would have added to, to that, to that, to that sort of party right, mix right. was, yes, was, yeah. was um, Iggy's Lust for Life. That was a very good start. One of the best use 
uh, uses of uh, of uh, of pop music in any film. I think the, the opening brilliant, scene, yeah. Train spotting is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, uh, Andy Miller rather approvingly said he once saw me dancing. I mean, quite a long time ago to uh, to, to Lust for Life, and he said to uh, this person who's standing, he said, "Yeah, that's a man who was I, I would guarantee was familiar with that song before Train Spotting." <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of which is true high praise from from Miller Absolutely. Um, the one bit of the one bit that I could find and this gives you was um the one ticket I could find was this oh wow oh, was, yes now oh. this main street was a really small club so a lot of the bands that would so come, this is in New Zealand we're talking about yeah, yeah a lot of the yeah. bands that would come would play in these quite small venues because mm -hmm. there was one radio it was the John Peel equivalent in New Zealand was a guy called Barry Jenkins and he played a, a, a kind of a two-hour show in the evenings on, like, like just like Peely, on Radio Haraki, and all of the interest in new music, you know, from kind of '70s sort of John Cale through to uh, through punk, through th through to you know, as I say, Joy Division, The Cure, all the all the kind of cool and interesting stuff. So, and I, I mean, I went. I guess I went through. Yeah, I went through. I was pretty, we were, we were very narrow. I mean, that period, we were very narrow. And then it started to kind of fall apart a little bit because secretly, secretly, we all still had, we all st still had uh, things like this at home. Oh, <laughs> of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, that's quite a long we all, way we all probably, up a drain we all probably by, had uh, rumors. by the members. We all probably had rumours. And I had Stars and Bars by Neil Young. You know, these oh, were, right. yeah, but we, did, yeah. we didn't take those to our parties to, to, uh, to upbraid the girls with. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's I, I, I then went through a, I went through, I, I, I guess I came back, I went through a big, um, Roxy music phase. I mean, 10 years after Roxy had been huge, but I remember finding Roxy were almost too weird when I was 10, you know, in the way that Slade worked. Um, and I don't know, became mildly obsessed with, with sort of middle period or this kind of period, Brian. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. You know, largely because you wanted to look like him. And yes. Also, I mean, it's, it's, a tremendously self-indulgent, miserable album, yes. The Bride Strip Bear, kind of vinegary, kind of about punk and, and self-pitying about the fact that Jerry Hall had just left him. But some, Do, I mean, Don't you think but, the story of Jerry Hall? Yes. And Mark and I were just occasionally That's have to a movie, stop. Isn't it? We just uh, have to go, hang on, is Jerry Hall still married to Rupert Murdoch? I know. Yes, I do believe she is. Is this it, the person who we used to all get, get very hot on with the collar about the fact that she'd left Brian Ferry for me? I think... Jagger? I think we should all write a letter to Craig Brown and say the subject of your next book. That's, oh, that's good. Yeah, Jerry is, Hall. I mean, because it's the whole of the late twenty and early twenty first century in in one strange. God, it is, and it's. It, but it's dizzying always, upper echelons as well. But it's also like the seventeenth century, the sixteenth century, fifteenth century, because beautiful woman needs patron. You know what I mean? That's. And you're leaping from one wealthy man to another. Yeah. And it, throughout the know, life. Or in fact, wealthier each time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you I remember mean, when she left Mick Jagger I, I, to go with Robert Sangster? Do you yes, remember Robert Sangster? Sangster? I mean, Sangster. I can't believe that when you think about it. I mean, I'm expecting the announcement about Bezos or, or yes, uh, yes, absolutely. any time Musk, now. Yes, <laughs> completely. Absolutely. <laughs> She's going to the moon with Bezos. <laughs> There you go. Good work from her. Oh, God. Oh, that's sorry, good. I uh, sorry, I just no, occasionally well, I, I, have to remind, I have to pinch myself to think. Cheerios married to Rupert Murdoch. It's extraordinary. Yeah, I know. When you see pictures of them together, I'm afraid to say it is very hard to uh, to you know, suppress a smile, isn't it? It is absolutely <laughs> absurd. <laughs> oh God. So the, come on, what else have you got? Have you no, got well, stuff well, so there? I got, I, so in 1982, what what happened? I told you. Well, I had my Brian thing that was going on. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I became yeah. quite obsessed with with Roxy music and 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 listened, you know, to all of the albums. Then I got. A, I, I, <laughs> this is not really. A, this is not really a, a pop music thing at all. I, I think I'm. Oh, bugger! I have left it downstairs. Uh, um, I got. I got obsessed with the soundtrack to Last Tango in Paris. I've, I've actually got the record. And I, I was, um, I'd been to Europe, so I would kind of, and I was working in a very cool 
place called John's Diner. Um, I was only one of three Johns working there, and I wasn't the John who, who set it up, who was an artist. But it was the beginning of kind of cappuccino culture. And, and you can imagine in Auckland, that was pretty exotic. And I was living in this amazing art deco flat in the middle in the middle of Auckland, looking out over the harbour, and we paying next to nothing for it. And because I'd been to Europe and I, you know, I, I was trying to grow a moustache and I had a you know, stripy T-shirt, I would, I would play the... Uh, the soundtrack to last tango very loud open my windows and play it very loudly but one of the things that that sort of what was on it i can't remember, I was trying to remember. Uh, I can't yeah with the, with, it's, with the... um, it, it's it's basically it's ghetto barbieri and it's you know and there's an accordion it's 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 weird it's french music mashed up with uh with tango music um, and maybe I don't know. I've, I've, I, after, at some time after that, I became enthusiastic, early adopter of what is now called or was then called world music. Right. And I've always liked I've always liked kind of discovering new weird sounds, usually to do with uh, people singing and strings and occasionally drums. But there was a jukebox in the diner, and that really I think that had an you know if you listen to music over and over again, you get to. Um, and there were some things on there that completely blew me away. Um, I've got a number of, I stole, I stole a, oh. <laughs> a stash of them when the, oh, when the that's diner an old, closed. that's an old HMV single you held up there. Yeah, His well, master's voice. Yeah, so um, ne- this brilliant, uh, brilliant Jackie Wilson single, You Were Made oh. For All My Love. Which, oh, is, yeah, yeah. which is, again, I never heard of Jackie Wilson. And then it was the beginning of my big... You know, I, I was I was not going to parties in 1982 with my Ramones and Sex Pistols in my plastic bag anymore. I was starting to cultivate. I like to think a more um, a, a more interesting, more. more uh, t- but well, discovering Dexys was the passport to, to, oh, to, De- to, uh, and to I, Jackie I, I, Wilson for a lot of people. But. Yeah, and you remember, of course, the famous Top of the Pops, where the, yeah, the, the, yeah. the Jockey picture, Wilson, the picture of Jockey Wilson, was Jockey Wilson. daggeringly funny. But, <laughs> All and my then, love was with the ridiculous descending chords and the orchestra and this amazing voice soaring over the top. So yeah. I, I, I've got then completely different, a very old, amazing version of Desifonado by Stan Getz. Oh, with a, wow. Yeah, amazing, I know that. Amazing I know that. rhythm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this is all part of, I've been to Europe. I am sophisticated. I yeah. can listen to jazz. Yeah. Yes. Kind of. Um, in the same vein, Vic Damone. Oh, um, God. Luna Rossa, which Don't you know, know it's just a, a, a just a, one of those beautiful, like, corny Italian kind of you know, lots of. This is educational for me. Was Coronetta a, a New Zealand label? Uh, well, you know, I'm looking. It must have been. I'm looking. I, I guess never it must it. have been. Yeah. Yeah. It was a division of Columbia, apparently. Oh, okay. Yeah. New Zealand Limited, yeah. Phillips Electrical Industries of New Zealand Limited. So a lot, a lot of my records are New Zealand, and then. Um, and then just totally this brilliant single by Ray Charles, Careless Love on one side oh, right. and You Don't Know Me on the other. Oh, you This don't must have been me. a fantastically hip cafe. You oh, and your striped I mean, T-shirt, nine, growing your moustache, playing the Stan Getz. I mean, the, the 1982 is, in Auckland. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. But the, the, book, the one record, the record that absolutely blew me away, and I don't know if you, not a lot of people know it, and it's, it's, it's 1968. It's the B-side to Dance to the Music, which everybody knows. It's Let Me Hear It From You by Sly and the Family Stone, which starts with this. It starts like it sounds like Sly has, has fallen onto a Hammond organ. It's an amazing kind of discordant. Yeah. And then it builds and it builds. And it's, it's a, a song of male, kind of male coercive control. You know, where we, what, what did you do last night? You know, it's, 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 it's the kind of, the, but it's brilliant. And I, that, and I think there was also, I think I also maybe nicked a, a, a kind of a, um, uh, uh, there was a couple of Aretha singles on there as well. So I started to listen seriously and to, to, um, to soul. And then, and then I got completely obsessed with blues and I, I, my, I, my, my musical chase, taste kind of expanded. And, and Which developed. particular blues artist? Um, I, I mean, I'm muddy waters all the way. I just, I, 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 I I've got a lot of, you know, I did all the Paul Oliver story of the blues stuff, which is great. There's a, there's an, yeah. some amazing uh, archival stuff, but I just love the, I love the guitar playing. Um, I love, and you know, I think, I still think that those 
the the two great I'm a man and you know Hoochie Coochie Man. They're phenomenal. I mean, they're, they're just every time I put them on, I still get the same jolt um, that I got the first time. I Can you to still? Do you know about this? Can you still get Paul Oliver the large format story of the blues? Because I don't know. Would, I haven't seen. No, he is amazingly. He turned up living literally ten minutes down the road. I went to see him give a talk in a little village hall. How Brooklyn, long ago? I, 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 I don't I mean, know is, anything like, about Paul Oliver, apart from the fact my flatmate had that book. And we used to sit and look at that book again and again and again. All those amazing old pictures. Incredible. Incredible. And, you know, the, the, the accompanying double album is amazing. Yes. Uh, then I went through, I, I went through, I would say that was around about the time, 82. And then coming back, I went through a, a, Elvis, Elvis, a Elvis sort of stiff style. period. Right. Dave Edmonds. Then these, these are uh, Nick Lowe, Cruel to Be Kind. Right. I mean, these are still, I still play, I still play these. <laughs> now I've got a turn. That was a really out. golden period, though, wasn't it? Oh, it was amazing. Uh, whole stiff. wide world, Reckless Eric. Did you um, ever see any of the stiff tours? No, you're probably still out in New, New No, New st- yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've seen, I've seen Larry I've Wallace, seen Elvis, Rachel Sweet. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but that was sort of, that was, I guess that was really where my, uh, th- that year of, of listening to, and I, I kind of, uh, what, what happened then? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I became a huge Elvis Costello fan, and that was uh, one of those albums I play every night going to sleep and every morning when I woke up. I, I know, I, as I discovered when Elvis played at Cornbury, um, and I was the only one singing along. He played quite a lot of weird back catalogue stuff that day, you know, right. um, particularly songs off the album. I still knew every single. Um, and then we moved and to London. a member of the audience, didn't he? Mo- moved to London. Uh, yes, he did. He uh, he he was he was very rude about David Cameron, who I think <laughs> was somewhere in the back of the room, um, which of course got a huge cheer from the crowd. It's been a little harsh, I think. It's a bit harsh picking out a member of your audience. I, th- I think ridicule. so. Ridicule. Yeah. Um, the other, then sort of round about that time, moved to, moved to, was it, was in Oxford. I used to go down to the Wag Club and where, where, um, and, I mean, now have, and the band that I most wanted to look like or be in was Blue Rondo a la Tour. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, it was just, oh. I just Dave and I used to work at Smash Hits and there was a little, uh, a kind of uh, new romantic magazine called New Sounds, New Styles that was started in one of our little back offices. And Blue Rondo, didn't they, Dave? You used to come in pretty much every day and hang around. Chris Sullivan. Yeah. Chris well, Sullivan. They had a record out called Clacto Vide Sustine. S- and they yeah. had those big old boxy <laughs> zoot suits. And, they, and Chris, of course, had been... I mean, I, I got to know Chris because in... In, no, I, I, I can't believe I don't have it, but I don't have a copy here. In, 90, in, t- in 2001, I published a huge £40 illustrated book. I, I think, as you know, I, I ended up publishing the Beatles anthology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I guess like a lot of people, I could, I mean, I could, yeah, I mean, I could, I could right. do this. I mean, I've, you know, got them all on vinyl because... But I didn't obviously buy them at the time because I was a child, or not yeah. a, but barely a child. Um, so the Beatles, so publishing the Beatles anthology was an amazing, amazing opportunity and a, a, an incredible thing. And getting to work with Neil Aspinall and and I've I've talked at length about that on uh, the Beatles book podcast and, and and other things. But it was, you know, it's fascinating to get into the heart of the beast. Yeah. And and still, you know, when I'd complain about my life, and you know, Neil would say. Yeah, in order for me to get a decision, he said, I've got to talk to Paul, which isn't easy. Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, whoever it is that Ringo's pretending to be that particular week, <laughs> George Harrison's estate, and then Yoko fucking Ono. <laughs> and I, I just said, yes, I see. So possibly getting any approval for any of this is going to... He said, it's not going to take a long time, John. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> Yeah. Throwing my marketing plan into the bin. Yeah. <laughs> but he was, what a story Neil is, though, isn't he? I mean, uh, the I guy mean, who started never, off driving the van, humping the gear, finished up being the architect of their entire. And he was so clever, so smart. One of, the, yeah. I mean, one of the most interesting and 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 and, and brilliant people I've ever met, and also very, you know, very funny. If you can see the bundle at wagon, you've already missed it. Um, <laughs> but but that, anyway, I, I, as as a next project, I got to know. 
David Costa, amazing David Costa, who uh, was in a band called Trees, which I've subsequently oh, come right. to, yeah. to, to, to sort of love because I, at the time, you know, nobody rem- was remembering them. And in 2000, nobody no. was remembering the Garden, no, the garden of Jane Delaunay. <laughs> Um, for reasons perhaps that aren't so surprising. Oh, yeah, that was another thing. I, I don't have any, but my parents, th- there, was, there was a brief moment when my mother decided she really liked Spe- Steel Eye Span. So we had a couple of Steel Eye Span records in the house, um, okay. both pre and post New Zealand, you know, which was kind of, I suppose. Oh, they were fantastic. Like. Yeah, they were kind the of. The early ones are great. Yeah, and I've subsequently, you know, we're not far from Cropperdy and I got to know some of the Fairport people i mean uh, you know and uh, so, you know retrospectively discovered the joys of richard thompson and and of yeah. of, of legion leaf and but anyway the point is uh, in 2001 with chris sullivan we made a book called punk a 40 pound 400 page where david costa who designed the beatles anthology who was had been in trees and i i said you've got to we want i want to do what we what we did with the beatles anthology but i want to do it for all of those for, for, for punk and Chris and, and Stephen Colgrave, who together told the story from pretty much from kind of the, the Velvet Underground through and where punk came from. And it was, I mean, it was amazing. We did, I mean, it, it, it didn't sell as well as the Beatles anthology, but I'm incredibly proud of it when you see it now. It's a perfect kind of mad moment of its time, you know, this beautiful mm-hmm. big coffee table book. Punk had, it was punk with a full stop. We thought, we felt that was extremely important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, I got, to know, I got to know Chris incredibly, incredibly well, and he's still a very, very good friend, and still had, and still, you know, he's still out there doing, doing it, doing his Soho radio shows. And but uh, yeah, in 1980, in 1983, I wanted that's that was that was the look I that wanted. I look. came nowhere, nowhere near. Let's be honest. <laughs> very few people did. Well, all yeah. you needed surely was a zoot suit, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, zoot suit and, uh, and amazing dance routines. They were, they were, they were, and I, I think I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many shapes Chris is throwing these days, but um, but he was, you know, they were incredible. He and Christos were incredible dancers. I mean, they would kind of come up through Wigan Casino, Northern yeah, Soul. So yeah, they were, yeah, they were, yeah, yeah. It was, it was that almost a sort of vaudeville thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I guess that was that's the kind of that that period in the 80s college go, going to london didn't go to see as many gigs and you know then you know had a kid in, by 1989 so um but what still the kind and of bands was, you were seeing at college um well i <laughs> i was at oxford so to be honest <laughs> I went to uh, I went to early Radiohead gigs, and I went to there were there was another band that we liked better than Radiohead called the Candy Skins. It was the who, Corn Exchange? Was the, yeah, and the, 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 the poly, and, and, yeah. and the, yeah, there were the the, the 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 what was called the Apollo. I, I don't even know if it was called the Apollo. And there were there were a couple of good venues, yeah, and then we'd go down, but we'd go down to London, and I you know we generally at that stage you'd be going to clubs rather than see. I, I was going. What was I suppose clubs rather than live bands? Um, so, um, and I, I, when I moved to London, as I say, I became kind of I started to buy, I sort of became fascinated by music from other cultures, and um, I brought it upstairs, but I probably didn't. Uh, um, there was a shop I can't remember what it was called. There's a shop called um, uh, Stearns. Stearns, yes, Stearns. That's exactly right. I used to I used to go and spend a lot of money in there, and I also I guess when I was at college I became seriously interested for the first time in classical music and just bought up lots and lots of you know original you know the, 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 there was that period where everything was being played on original instruments which I thought was cool because it was a right. bit like jazz and so oh, what, again my, my taste sort of my ta- my taste sorceries. expanded but also you know falling in love with people my wife Rachel was a huge Joni Mitchell fan so. I'd never really listened to Joe. So I, I, I you know, I, I, you, I know you're going to ask me greatest of all time at some point. And, uh, um, you know, Joni Mitchell's Blue, uh, all that sequence of albums that she recorded in the early 70s are as good as almost anything. Mm. But also... Um, Dave and I argue about this all the time. Is Blue really as great as Court and Spark? Cold I mean, spark, very upbeat and very I sunny. Think, Blue, I, I, I all about want, I wouldn't want to have to choose between them. I mean, listen to them both still. And also... Um, and I suppose with Rachel, uh, Astral Weeks became a yeah. You know, 
Um, and we got the, <laughs> I still quote you all the time on your, you know, the world divides into two camps, <laughs> the people who love Van Morrison and the people who've met Van Morrison. <laughs> And I feel honest, increasingly embarrassed about that. Actually, let's be, Although, well, let's be honest. He's not made. He's not had a good lockdown. He's not. No, he has <laughs> had a good lockdown, and he's not making any more friends. And I suppose it has been proved slightly true, actually. And, but uh, I just feel a bit. I mean, it was a bit harsh have, at the time. And you know, I don't think the new stuff is. But I did get to see him play Astral Weeks live at the at the Hollywood Bowl, and that would be very close, along with you know seeing the Ramones and the Clash at the Logan Campbell Centre in New Zealand. Those would be very close to the best gigs I'd ever seen. Um, Did I he saw... talk to the audience? Did he face the audience? He faced the audience. He did. I mean, it was, I'd, I confess, I'd, I'd not seen him live before, so I was expecting the worst. But I don't know if you, the Hollywood Bowl's amazing. amazing. You, you sit, you get a little kind of enclosure and you can, you can order food. So you can sit there eating, drinking, watching. It's like a kind of, I mean, it's madness. And I got told to shut up by Charlize Theron at one point because I was singing along so loudly to her. To her. And he played, it was a, an astonishing gig. He, he kind of went, he went from um, uh, the end of Astral Weeks, I think, into, uh, or maybe no, he, he, he went into Listen to the Lion from St. Dominic's Preview into Astral Weeks. And it was a lot of the original musicians, and it was live. And he'd never played the album live, and he did the whole thing. It was, it was, it was. I want great. to know which song you were joining in on, John. I'm trying to imagine Charlie's <laughs> yeah. annoyance. I'm trying, what is it? What is it? Slim, slow slide. It was sweet thing. It was sweet. Sweet thing. Okay. <laughs> and you were kind of yes, yeah, sweet <laughs> thing, sweet. <laughs> and she turned around and she it wasn't i don't think she even said she just it was the look and she was you know dressed down she wasn't um but and i know it was and i know it was her because she was shortly joined by liv tyler who was unmistakable and they i just thought this is i'm in la and i'm being sh told to shut up by i love know, the idea of being told to shut up by a celebrity yeah. did, you, did you catch this did you catch this during the uh the the, the coverage of the european championship Roy Keane was saying he'd gone to a Neil Diamond concert. Did you see that? <laughs> Years earlier, when they talk about Sweet Caroline, said, yeah. my wife, we went to we went to see uh, Neil Diamond. It's very good, actually. <laughs> but there was a woman behind me who was singing. I had to turn around and tell her to shut up. I thought, my God, imagine if the, if the person turns around at the row in front and it's Roy <laughs> It's Roy Keane. Roy Keane. You, you wouldn't argue, though. Would you, you? Would, you would definitely. <laughs> you as I, say, I think as you'd say, make it. Exactly. Like Mike Tyson, you, you'd you'd stay, you'd stay you quiet would, after you that, know, very you? quiet. You kind of figured that the life of Mrs. Keene must be very complicated, you know, because if, if your husband complains about anything, people are terrified, aren't they? Yeah, this is Roy Keane. Um, I mean, it's I I I I think that 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 thing about Van. I mean, I subsequently saw him play at Cornbury, and he was poor and did that i think he was. Unfor unforgivable thing you were you were there yeah, it was, yeah, yeah it was he, there. he pissed off and left his band on the stage they played for 15 Absolutely. minutes and yeah. everybody was shouting for an encore he was gone he was in the car he was, he was in the car already motoring across the oxford countryside <laughs> <laughs> i know that's terrible um but, but that's one of those contractual agreements isn't it you know 50 yeah. minutes and you're off. But I, I mean, you know, I would Very never style. have planned. It was one of those things. I was in LA for a conference. A friend of mine said, do you know Van's play? Van Morrison's playing Astral Weeks tonight. I said, get out of here. And I said, well, I've, I've got tickets. Do you want to come? So we, a, a group of about six of us went and it was, it was a, it was a brilliant night. And I subsequently, Rachel was furious because she felt quite rightly, she'd sort of got me into Van Morrison, you know, yeah. at the early, the early yeah. stages of our relationship. Yeah, it was a lot of Van and a lot of Joni Mitchell and quite a lot of um, a bit of, quite a lot of Marvin Gaye, and then um, she. So I took her. She, he did it again in the Royal Albert Hall, and it wasn't quite. We got good seats, but it wasn't quite as good. No, it was, it, he he was good, but not quite as good. What have you converted her to? <laughs> Ramones. <laughs> yes, yes. You were so. There were three things that Rachel refused to countenance when we got together. One was the films of Andre Tarkovsky. The other was the music of Bob Dylan. And the third really? was the, yeah, the music of uh, Bruce Springsteen. Because she basically said, every man I've ever been out with has tried to get me to watch the films of Tarkovsky, listen to the brilliance of Bob Dylan, and uh, accept that, you know, the greatest... The, the, so... <laughs> Um, God, that's a big statement to say. I will not have you playing. Does that mean you're not allowed to play Bob Dylan around the house? No, you're not. Was this sure. in the vows? 
on <laughs> Yes, it could have been. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I've gradually worn her Richer down. Richer for I've poorer. gradually worn her down over over Tarkovsky. But what what happened? What's happened with Bruce, which has been the interesting thing, is that uh, two things happened. One is she she's um, a massive fan of the city and culture and music of New Orleans. So she, I have. Uh, I mean, because for, for one reason or another, we've never managed to go together. But we got friends who live there, so she goes to Jazz Fest, which is amazing. Uh, um, you know, if you if you love her, she does black music in particular. It's the greatest gathering of black talent, and uh, in an amazing venue with great food. Anyway, she went a few years ago, and Bruce played, yeah, yeah, yeah. and she was very resistant. But my friend Gordon said, "No, you've got to come and see him. If you've never seen him, you've got to see him." Anyway, she. She softened somewhat after his three and a half, half hour magnificent set. And then my friend, her, one of her best friends is a, is a great Bruce fan, as I am. Um, and that Bruce theme, I think, started, yeah, that was probably New Zealand. And I never got, I never got to see him. Like, oh, I did see an amazing ELO gig uh, in, in New Zealand, uh, which was, I mean, completely brilliant. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge ELO fan. A, f- a fanship I share peculiarly with, you know, about the only person I can really kind of geek out to ELO is Jonathan Meads. Jonathan Meads, right. polymath, yeah. Yeah. filmmaker. Uh, he's a massive. In fact, for a long time... Well, well ELO have first... been a major fixture on We're in Your Attic. Yeah, yeah. They the number of people, partly because I think it's people Everybody who, likes who just want... Everyone likes them, and they kind of think it's the sound the Beatles might possibly have made. If made. They if they, if, so yes, there's a sort of element of that. The, if, if you take the Napier Bell thesis that the Beatles never became a rock band, if they had become a rock band, they wouldn't have become Wings. They might have become ELO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, discuss. Love it. Anyway, I was that, that was a, a, a digression within a digression. Um, I, I was talking about ELO. Why was I talking about ELO? I can't remember. I was yeah, talking about, you're talking because... about your, your wife's three... Um... Yes, Oak Springsteen. Yeah. So, triple, triple her, my, her best friend Polly is a massive Spring, Springsteen fan, and we, you know, evenings, kitchen discos, which still take place, at some point Springsteen will come in, come on, the river will be played or Jungle Land will be played, and Polly and I will dance rapturously singing along. And I think this is sort of touched, Rachel, to the extent now she kind. And then I, we listened to one, uh, one um, coming back from her mother's on the Isle of Wight. We listened to Spring, the On Broadway album, which is him singing and telling his songs. Yeah. Very, very, you know, fireside sort of chats and teeing up. And, you know, the charm of Bruce and the kind of, the kind of brilliance and warmth and, and sincerity and all of those things, I think can, she's kind of, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't say that she would say that she was a, a fan, but she's kind of, you know, she's definitely, whereas the small progress I've made with Bob Dylan, which she will never, she would never listen to willingly herself is that she, when people were asking what they could buy me for my birthday at work. And she said, well, he's got this new turntable, which is, I finally got vinyl back into my life this Christmas. My family, I hadn't had vinyl since 1993. I kept all my records, but I had nothing to play them on for one reason or another. So they bought me a, a new system amp, marvellous speakers. So I've been, I've oh, been listening was, to old music. must be a joy audio. to reacquaint yourself. Oh, it's just, I mean, all habit. of these old singles, it's just yeah. all, with all the pops still in the same place. Yeah, absolutely. Crackles. The anyway, with um, Dylan is she, that she, not she got them. She recommended two Dylan albums. She said, "Buy he like no, I will never buy them for him, but he likes them, and he hasn't got them on vinyl, so they did." And I, she, she was, she didn't leave the room when I played them on my birthday. And, um, See, so. here's the funny, here's the funny thing, and I mean, Mark and I particularly have been professionally involved in doing exactly this for years and years. But the truth is, the whole idea of you've got to listen to this, you really like it fundamentally doesn't work never never works. it just never it's works like, it's He's like arguing on social media you never, no is. one's mind no one has ever changed their mind because <laughs> never. of a tweet if you say you will like this people immediately the hackles rise and people Absolutely. just just build some kind of opposition the only problem is that with the, the, the advantage with springsteen he's such a great self-salesman yeah. if you see him or, or in concert if you if you if you hear him interview He's so winning and so yeah. soulful and so well, sweet natured. Whereas Dylan is pretty much the opposite. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan is not a very good self salesman at all. Did you no. watch the Shadow Kingdom thing the other night, by the way? No, was it? Uh, yeah, that was really good. Really yeah, good. I know. I've, was... I've got a, I've got a, always. I mean, it's it's. I did. I I, I did love the uh, Rolling Thunder review. I mean, that mad long Scorsese Dylan. Brilliant. Um, it was just absolutely. I mean. 
So, I, I, yeah, I can have Dylan on in the house. I'm not going to yeah. tell to turn that rubbish off, like as it were, by a kind of like a parent. But um, uh, yeah, it's 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 it's. I I I think now with music, I don't know. I was thinking about this. Has yes, I, I would say that m- I used to love making tapes, and I still call them. The boys, I think it's hilarious. Oh, I've got that on a tape. Right. You, it's a playlist dad I said, well you know it's the same thing Come <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but that that thing of love gifts i remember sending rachel kind of um we uh, we sort of bonded over the brilliant lyle lovett album called jo- joshua judges ruth mm-hmm. and an early lucinda williams sweet old world I that's mean, a that, great record yeah. they, they're, they're, that, that, that kind of sending you know sending albums but then making tapes out of other stuff there's always and I still, I, I still make, I still make, I like, I like making play. I still enjoy making playlists, but I, I find it very, I don't know. It's just, it's so great having, having, I actually now enjoy getting up and ch- ch- turning the records over again. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether the sound is any better or different. I, I feel it is, but that the ceremony, just... the ceremony's better. That's the point. You're connected. You're, to it. you're engaged. You're part of a whole procedure. Because you know, uh, of the greatest, like reading uh, a book. Of the greatest album question, I went. And I was thinking. I was looking at, uh, at what's going on, which should be right up there for me. And uh, there's only three tracks on the B side. On the set, yeah. Well, I mean, pretty, yeah, yeah, aside, yeah. It was, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. You forget, you forget, and you realise how how though that architecture was really important. Knowing where songs came in the album and knowing what was, you know, it's. it's um, I, ha- I have, I don't think I've got it anymore, but I think dazed and confused is a whole side on uh, the song remains the same double EP live Led Zeppelin. Uh, you know, those are the days. <laughs> I can still hear tracks and immediately hear in my head what the next track should be. Yes. You hear them in isolation because you're so can used you to re- them in that sequence. Yeah. But can yeah. you remember the interesting quiz? Can you remember the opening tracks to Second Sides? Well, for instance, I'm going to try you on this live. I think Martin knows the answer to this. What's, <laughs> what starts the Second Sides of Sergeant Pepper? Oh, it's the... It's the George Harrison. Um, it's within oh, you, without it's within you, without you. Which is a really unusual, you. very, way very start unusual way to start. Side. Yeah, yeah. Because normally they would have plonked another, another kind of um, toe tapper. Toe tapper. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's. I'm, I'm in. I'm my son's doing music production at Bristol, and he is, you know, sort of synth. But he, you know, he absolutely. It's all vinyl. They're buying, oh, they're buying yeah. everything on vinyl now. Absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> Which is great. I mean, great. I mean, I've got my youngest boy's a massive King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard fan. He's and they seem to produce about twenty albums a year. Well, this is what they all do yeah. now. There's a stack of these it's, it's crazy fine, coloured vinyls, fine and they all sound just... vaguely the same. But I mean, yeah, well, but they know that there are like, people out there collecting like the fall. You know, it's a bit like, like the fall know, the... or the Grateful Dead. You've got yeah. to have the lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, John, John, two questions. Go on to end with one. Since the sad death of Dusty Hill of ZZ Top, did you not get the call? <laughs> Surely. Um, no? Uh, <laughs> did anybody talk about that? Just as a stand-in. Well, yes. I mean, also, well, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a sad, it's a sad day for music, I have to say. And they're such a great band and such a great look. And I, this is, I have to have say, you just, have you ever this been is to ZZ? This is just... Been- um, yeah, I mean, I, I get Rick Rubin, or sometimes when my beard's smaller, I've even had Kenny Rogers, which is, I don't know, I kind of, I, I, still, have a, I still have a soft spot for, for, for the kind of, you know, 70s Kenny Rogers. But, but you, no. did you ever go to a ZZ Top show? And were you ever the, in the front row? Oh, I guess because no. that would have been a joy if you'd gone in been, the front row. It would, you would have been signing all the along with Stenson. The closest I've got Arrived to that on a, buffalo. a beard off was I did, I did interview, interview, um, Brian Blessed once. Oh, right, right. In the end, I just, I rather theatrically tore my uh, question sheet up. On just stage. let him go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let yeah. him go. He did. He did. Uh, <laughs> it, what's it? What's the line? I've, I've blacked it out through horror. Gordon's alive. Is that what it's called? Or what, what, it's it's the, the famous one. For, he said it about nine times, and every time he got a huge cheer from the. <laughs> I mean, it was the, it was kind of it was like it was more like being at the circus than any literary gig I've ever been. He's, he's a self-contained he is the most entertainment, cut, isn't he? He's he just is the most cartoonish character. He's ridiculous. I mean, 
and, 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 and in a theatrical way, he talks, you know. Yes, and it, it just it, turns it, it, it and he gets in the morning. Stop. And, I mean, like, I you know. think sometimes, you know, you come off stage and say, fuck, fuck that's over, right? Let's go, go, yeah. go and get a beer. It's no, I'm, oh, 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 come, come to me, come to my queue. I'm signing yes. books for you all. A pint of your finest falling down water, <laughs> but stout barman. Oh. <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, human of the bar. Uh, exactly. So, so the, final... the last question we yes, should ask Dave, yeah, is, is the greatest. You probably told us already, but the greatest record ever made. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say it would, it, it will be a punch up between what's going on Astro Weeks and probably Blue Stroke Court and Spark. Can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But I'm, I'm not going for that. I'm going for this. This, this is what will be played at my funeral. Oh, go on. What is it? It is on Shake Some Action by the Flaming Groove. I've laid oh, some action wonderful. by the Flaming And it is, yeah. there is a, a, a kind of marvellous, uh, there's a marvellous, I didn't realise this. I mean, I heard it and when the first time I heard it, I said, that's my favourite record. And I've said it since I was 16 years old. That's, when people say, what's your favourite record? I say, Shake Some Action by the Flaming Groovies. It has every, it just has everything in it. I have no idea what it's about. Some strange, unspecified longing, some kind of forward propulsive, you know, I, I don't know what it is that he's don't go back that way. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's got the same guitar solo played once and then played it kind of again at the end of the song. It's got, you know, four on four driving rhythms. It's, it's, it's got this sort of great guitar sound. I d subsequently discovered that Grail Marcus was also a fan of the song and wrote about it. And he said this thing, which I, I, I think is closer to, it's closer to what I think than anything else I've read. Uh, let me see if I can get it for you because it, I mean, he also, he does say Flaming Groovy is a name so stupid it can't transcend its own irony. <laughs> it is a terrible name. Uh, but, but it's such a brilliant title for a song, isn't he it? He said that it was, he taught, yeah. It's every, it, So he says, the point is that before rock and roll, as it was defined by those performers, he's gone through a long list. And a thousand, uh, uh, those performers, those records, and a thousand more. Nothing like what happens in Shake Some Action had ever been heard on earth. And I, I think that's the thing. It's everything that rock and roll and he makes this point he said you know although rock and roll sort of came out of country blues he said it somewhere it's a neil young interview it's like i've got a thousand year old fish living inside me that moment and i was thinking about this right back to that hearing those chords in boomtown by the fucking new seekers it's just it shake some action is kind of it's if you wanted to you know the, your aliens david if you wanted okay. to say explain to me the appeal of rock and roll what is this thing what is this cultural form just listen to that and if you're not if you're not moved and astonished by it then go back to your own planet you know uh, leave us to leave us old men nodding uh, well, uh, you, and, you and, and jumping up and down in our living rooms and, and still wanting to shake some action whatever that means you'll be pleased you'll be pleased to hear i've just put i've been putting together a four cd compilation of great 70s tunes that are less less well known than they ought to be and that's on it shake some action. well you know it's 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 i'm i do sometimes to the the tedium of my friends and family i'm i and I, I, I before actually I, I read your brilliant 1971 book i i, I picked 79 as the as the year oh, i thought I where the greatest music com confluences, you know, it was kind of, you had Cure and Joy Division beginning to happen. You had all of disco, you had kind of, you know, great seventies rock still being, be, being performed. And I can play, you can play hours of that, that stuff. And I, I just think, I, I don't know. It, it's, you know, you don't want to have, you don't want to be that old guy in the corner of the room saying it's not, it's not like it used to be, but I mean, it was. It's. It is astonishing the depth and range. The, the seventies are a much, a much derided decade. But surely, oh, the great, surely the greatest decade for the music. Oh, Danny Baker's whole thing about from nineteen. What happened between nineteen sixty nine and nineteen seventy six? It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. You know, all, all of that, you know, progressive rock, glam rock, reggae. Well, it's disco. also. It's also the thing I say again and again. We like to think nowadays things move faster. No, they don't. They move slower nowadays. Yeah. yeah I yeah. think she used to move far quicker. Probably the same in the book business. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, and I think it's interesting that when, when it, very similar that you know our podcast is entirely de dependent on this idea that people go back and find yes, things that are, are still 
of ext- I mean, you know, deep value that that are just happen to be old. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I'm, a lot of my, I mean, all three of the albums that I would have picked, you know, four of the albums were not albums I listened to when I was a teenager. I discovered those later through, you know, through life. It's a bit like the way that your sort of brain changes and develops as you as you live. I mean, I think your musical taste does the same thing. Yeah, yeah but sure. there's something about. There's something about shapes of action that's oh, is. Is just that was so well, so well expressed too. It's fantastic. It's a brilliant record. Well, what fun. Well, it's great. I mean, John, lovely to talk to you. <laughs> it's been really entertaining joy and delight. And, um, um, Word in your attic, a zoom with a view.